Okay, um, so we're gonna make this, um, uh, it's, this is a, a series of, of talks that we're, we're preparing uh, to, uh, particularly because of, of the situation we're living, uh, the way some of us are working from home uh, and the, the, the architecture, the, our discipline is being, is being changed a little bit and, and I think it's important to, for, for our students to try to understand uh, how the different design studios, architectural studios are, are, are evolving or are getting through this situation. Uh, I, I've noticed that for the students, it's, it, it become a, a lots of stress for them uh, trying to work differently from home. So, so for for us as a school, it's all it's also been been a, a challenge, and I I see for all schools it's been like that. They're working, uh, doing uh, home 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 office or homework, it's been a, a big challenge for them. So that's why I want them to see that it's not they're not alone, <laughs> that this is uh, something that is happening to everybody, and and that the importance of 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 of, of us to listen to you. And how are you approaching this? Uh, it's it's very important for them and for for the discipline. And and one of the ideas that, that that we're trying to talk also it's what do we what what might be different after we we overpass this this situation? What could change on the way we see architecture? And 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 looking in a positive positive way. Okay. So I'll introduce uh, Jeff Spitak. I I. I I appreciate you. Uh, uh, I, you are talking to us on, on this matter, and I know him for several years. Uh, he's a very talented architect uh, and very good businessman. I see. I see it like that, um, and and he he's being able to to put everything uh, together to make successful buildings. In the, I think you have six years, six years with your uh, studio. Uh, so, so for for us to listen to you, it's gonna be a real pleasure. And I'd like to give you the warm welcome from from our students at Escuela Libre de Arquitectura. And you can take the the screen from now. <laughs> Bienvenido. I think you're on, you're on mute. Hold on one second. Can you take it up? Okay, cool. Okay, so you can hear me now. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, I am a, an architect and a businessman, like you said. I hope the business comes after the architecture, though. That's the idea, um, that the architecture is always first. But, um, but uh, anyway, beyond that, thank you guys all for joining. Um, I don't know how many people are actually here, but um, I can only see four. But... I'm assuming there's more. Um, so anyway, I'll just get going. I, I am going to talk to you guys about um, my studio and you know what is changing um, in regards to the global pandemic that we are all a part of right now and um, how my studio is, is working through that and uh, what I'm seeing in my projects and what I'm seeing kind of uh, in terms of construction and also in terms of property management because we also own and operate our buildings. Um, so we have tenants, uh, we have, you know, multiple tenants that are dealing with the same thing and we have to deal with our banks and our loans and everything else. So that's kind of the business side of it. Um, so um, anyway, uh, to get started, I'm gonna share with you guys uh, a project I haven't not presented before. Um, it's a high rise, a residential high rise that I'm working on. It's a 20 story tower in, um, in downtown San Diego. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'll get onto that and then I'll talk about the, uh, the office situation. So this project is called The Fellow. Um, it's 20 stories, uh, it's all residential. It has one small commercial space um, that's more just like a neighborhood amenity, like a coffee shop or something like that. And, uh, you know, 
for the tenants. Um, but the, the majority of the building is focused on residential. Um, can you see yes. her, my cursor? Yes. Okay, great. So this, this is downtown San Diego. For most of you, you probably know this, but if you don't, this is kind of the, the big picture of downtown San Diego. You have you know, Little Italy, which is, exists down here. Um, and then you have kind of this uh, gas lamp district, which is kind of flows through here in the middle. You have Petco Park here. We have the new library from Rob, Rob Quigley here. And then you have this huge section that's up and coming area in this, and this is East Village. Uh, so there's a lot of development going on in this area. It's um, a very transformative space right now. Um, it's also, this is the, the I-5 interstate. So if you start to see the context of all this, this, this kind of limits downtown growth. So you can see we're currently pushed back here up against this limit of growth. Um, and so the downtown area of San Diego is actually fairly limited. So you're starting to see all these little sites that were fairly industrial and, and um, you know, with warehouses or whatever, starting to get, you know, pretty much they're all bought out by large, large scale developers now. Um, so we are here, this little yellow box, this isn't the actual building design, but um, you can kind of understand here the context. Uh, so you have the, you know, the, the San Diego Bay here, this is Coronado Island, and then, you know, you have the Pacific Ocean here in the background. Um, so, you know, we're trying to take advantage. Uh, our site is here on, there's this, this is J Street, this is 16th Street. So we're on the corner here looking out towards the water. And, um, and this is an image of the site from the ground floor. So you can see kind of the grittiness um, or the, you know, the context of the area. Um, there is, a, it, it, it's a developing area. So you have a lot of brand new buildings and you have a lot of very old buildings and you have this moment of transition that's happening. So, um, so it's important to, to be sensitive to that, I think. Um, and, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that context and relationship of the building and some of the ideas, because when you're do dealing with the high rise, I guess this was my first experience with it, but you kind of have the, the immediate context of the building and how that's, that's interacting with the street life, uh, the people of the city and uh, the rest of the neighborhood. And then you have the tower that's up in the sky that kind of becomes a whole separate element. So I really, I really work to separate the two into almost like two different, um, two completely different programs of the building. Um, so I'm gonna go through like the original ideas that were like the first sketches that I did. Um, and, uh, and then show you how those have kind of translated into what the actual the building is and, and how I've been dealing with it. So this was the, the first sketch I did. Um, this, is, this is 16th Street here. This is J Street here. So this is the corner of the building uh, that's- That's the lot size? What's, the I'm lot, sorry. The lot size? The lot size is 10,000 square feet. So mm -hmm. in meters, I don't know, but a hundred feet. So 30 meters maybe mm -hmm. by 30 meters, a hundred feet by a hundred feet. Yeah. Like 1,000 square meters around. Yeah. And, um, and so anyway, th this, you know, the building, if you look at this picture, the building, I didn't want the building to have a big grand entryway. It kind of wanted to be, I think, like a smaller threshold that came, that got you into a little bit more of a protected environment and kind of transported you as a filter space from, from the context of what's happening on the street life and the city into a more imaginative space, which is what's happening inside the building. So there's different various moments of of thresholds and filters that are taking you from the street into the building, kind of getting oriented with that and then taking you through these other experiences um, that happen on these first couple levels. And, uh, and again, so the idea was kind of this darker, this tunnel, so to speak, that takes you out. And this tunnel acts as a little bit of a, a transition moment from the street into the building. And then you have a, a, you know, a double height 
entryway as you approach in here with a stair that takes you up to this outdoor park that was kind of floating um, floating above uh, above the city. So you're um, we're above the first level of the of the street light. So you'd come up this stair and then you'd have this big grand open space with planters surrounding you on all sides. And still, you know, kind of in your own little introspective environment back here. Um, and this was going to be the big community space so that people could hang out. Uh, there's a big, you know, kind of kitchen island that I had here and, and lounge spaces. And then getting up to the third floor, I had this like floating garden that was like spilling out kind of into the street. So again, these were just the very, very first ideas. This was before I got into any structural engineering or really knew anything about designing a tower. Um, they were just concepts, right? To have kind of these three stories of, of public spaces, semi-public spaces, and then getting into the more private spaces, like up onto the fourth floor of the actual building. Um, so this is as the building exists today. So again, you can see there was a lot of programmatic things that had to get in just mm -hmm. that need to operate a high rise. So I, I, I had to stash all those kind of back here, but the core concepts of the building, those stayed the same throughout. So, you know, we have this tunnel entryway, you know, it gets you into this double height space where you have a filtered light that takes you, you know, kind of this Northern soft light that washes this whole entryway approach. Um, this is a mail room. Um, so the mail room is, is actually quite celebrated. I mean, it's something now in today's world that we get everything via the mail, packaging, Amazon, everything, you know? So I think this is actually a programmatic shift. I think that's happening in a lot of buildings mm -hmm. is it is a, it is a celebratory moment. I think the mail room now, so we made this mail room with this double height space and 18 feet of glass that you can come in and get your packages and get your mail just because so much of our shopping and everything is happening, you know, through kind of this interceptor right here. Um, so that's, that's an important part of the lobby. So again, that's your introduction. This is the small commercial space uh, here on the corner. It connects to a little patio out um, that's open to the sky back here. And, uh, and then this is where you'd come up from this staircase from the lobby and you have, this is all this lighter gray is all exterior space. And then this is all a big community kind of co-working space that connects you back out to these gardens uh, again that I was talking about. So you feel like you feel the building almost at two scales. One is the street scale, which is, I would call it like a three or four story building with elevated gardens at multiple levels. And then a tower that kind of sits on top of that. Um, so again, you couldn't go up one more story and you have this outdoor room, which we're making into like an outdoor theater room. And all of this is surrounded by gardens. So it works as a break, um, you know, again, it's this like, three stories of transitional spaces, community spaces before you get up into the residential spaces. And it also works as a nice interaction with the street with all these elevated gardens, especially in a city where, you know, landscaping and, and parks are, are not, uh, not that prolific. They're, they're pretty rare to have those spaces. So I think giving that space back um, is an important component of this project. So there you can see an image um, of what this looks like in the render. Um, so, so this is where that break is, I would say, happening. So you almost have a completely separate programmatic context in this space. And then from the, from the level, the fourth level here, you start to get into the actual private residential units. But you know, the context of this, I see so many buildings now that you know, they just have these big blank walls that face the, the, the city and they're not helping our, our cityscapes at all. You know, some, so many people want to put their parking lots here on above the ground because it's less expensive to build that way. But what it's leading to is these blank walls and the completely uninspired um, cityscape. And uh, so I, I really wanted to break the mold of what I saw as problematic elements of high rises in this building, and, and this was that first approach in creating this park-like gesture, you know, to the city and giving it back, back to the city as, as an amenity type space for them. 
So then once you get in, this is the kind of one of the community spaces. So again, it, it's, it's pretty well protected, um, you know, from the street with these gardens, but still is filtering a lot of light in, you know, the, the plant life, I think, yeah, especially living in a city is, is very important. It's something that most buildings don't offer that much of. And, you know, just in terms of wellness and health and everything, um, I, it was really important to bring that into these spaces and to make, you know, most of these units are, are pretty small. Um, they're, I don't, in square feet, they're averaging about 500 square feet. I don't know what that is in square meters. 50 um, square meters. <laughs> but, um, but they're fairly small. Um, so uh, it was important to have a space, you know, several spaces like this where people can come down and hang out and, you know, kind of feel a larger grand gesture towards leisure and towards, you know, coming down, reading a book or doing their work for the day and, uh, you know, giving people the opportunity to not have to leave the building to get into a great space like this and, and, um, and be able to work from these spaces. And especially now with what's happening, I mean, you know, with travel restrictions and everything, I think these type of spaces are going to be even more valuable, um, you know, because we're all have to kind of stay at our place and, and, uh, mm -hmm limit limit our movement so um, this allows all the all the uh, tenants of the building to work here if they want you know so it'll be set up with wi-fi with everything that you need to to work for the day this is um and then this is the space that's just kind of above that so you know these balconies look down to that space below and you come up another exterior stair and uh, you have this outdoor um, space that's essentially just the the bones of the tower and it's just carved out space uh, without any walls or anything else put in it and uh, and just a planter you know in place of, of what would normally be residential units so um, you know a typical developer I think wouldn't do something like this you know they would see this as square footage that they can rent and um, and then again that's why you know, a lot of your, the buildings we see now, they don't really offer much back to the city in terms of, of um, a street wall. They are just blank facades or glass walls that just go straight up and they don't connect to any sort of life uh, on the street level. So I wanted to, to provide an alternative to that. Here. So somehow, somehow, sorry to interrupt, somehow uh, you're giving more uh, pub, uh, public space, uh, private pu public space, but less livable square footage yes okay. yeah and i think it's important and especially you know one of the things we want to do is establish a community in this building and um i think these spaces are important for people to come together and i think it's important important for people to come together yeah um and if you offer them a great space it's going to be something that they'll want to come down to you know we're going to do movie screenings down here uh, we can, it's, it's very flexible. It can be a yoga studio, you know, we can have private parties. We can have a lot of things happening up here. Um, again, that just offer that, you know, a little bit more sense of social component to, to the building as well. Yeah, of course. Um, and then we have the tower, um, which, you know, the design of the, of a tower is obviously you're floating up in a sky. So you, you pay attention to the larger context. Um, this is a, a grainy image, but it was the best one that I could find this morning. <laughs> but um, you can uh, you can see what we are dealing with here. So our tower is right here, uh, and it faces out this way. So it faces out to this kind of this beautiful Coronado Bridge that has this nice curve and the water, and then you know the Pacific Ocean beyond. So it was important. This view was obviously very important. I mean, the views this way of the city are also nice. Uh, the views this way of the mountains, you can see like the mount, the background of the mountains are also very nice. Um, but looking back here, which is east, we have an internal lot line. So someone can build right up next to us and looking back this way, which is north, we also have an internal lot line. So eventually someone's going to build um, on either sides of us there. So the idea was to really focus on the corner and focus out here towards the water as much as we could. Um, 
So this was my first sketch of what that meant. So basically, instead of a flat facade um, here, this, I'm sorry, this view looking out this way is towards the water, kind of like, actually, like, if you follow this line, it's like almost a straight shot out towards the, towards the bridge that way. So instead of just doing a straight line here, um, I extended the facade by carving out this V structure. Uh, so basically by cutting this out, I was able to grow and have almost all of my units, which there's 10 here, all of the units, except for this back corner one facing out, facing out towards the street. And uh, the other thing that it allowed me to do is break this into two volumes. And then I was able to get these exterior corridors, which take you, which take you to your unit, um, which again, I'll get into later, but you know, one of the most like kind of sad part of these high rises is from the moment you walk in a lot of high rises from the moment you walk into the moment you get to your unit you're in this elevator and then this dark corridor and it's this repetitive kind of um space of just carpet and and re repeated doors just taking you down a monotonous hallway that you know is the same on every single level so I wanted to break away from that and really allow ventilation to get through these spaces allow light and air to get through these spaces. So, you know, these can be cross ventilated units. These can be cross ventilated units. Um, and, uh, and so that break, while it's very expensive to do in a tower, I found out, still was a really strong component and one of the main components of this tower. And then it allowed this whole wall being a facade with a view instead of just, you know, one wall here. So it just extended extended the length of, of my facade. And this is the floor plan as you see it now. As you can see my original sketch, I didn't understand some of the uh, fire safety elements, which you needed, you need, you know, on your elevator shaft, you need a, an enclosed lobby that has to have, be big enough to hold eight firefighters. And there's all these crazy um, restrictions for, for life safety, which are great. But again, starting like this was when I just started, I didn't really know. But once even getting all that stuff in, you know, conceptually everything stayed the same. Um, so, so I was happy that we were able to keep all of that. You know, you, you get out of your elevator lobby here and you have this filtered light through the corridor here. You get out of your elevator, out of the elevator lobby here and you have this exterior corridor which actually has views out to the mountains. There's a little social space here on every, on every floor. So, you know, people that are coming out you know, taking out your trash. This is a trash chute here. This is a communal laundry room here. So it allows these people to interact in a space that's comfortable. Um, you know, the least comfortable place to have a conversation is, is either an elevator or a dark hallway. So I think these type of spaces invite a little bit more of that informal interaction. Um, and then here you can just see a little breakdown of the units. You know, they're they're small, but they're very functional in how they work. Everybody gets a nice living space. Um, most people get an exterior space. These exterior spaces kind of alternate every other floor. Um, and then there's a there's a mix of just you know one bedrooms and studios as as you go up. Uh, so here you can see an image of of that view, um, and uh, you know you can see the the amount of glass and views here was able to increase the amount of units with views was able to increase by taking this V cut, you know, out of the building there. Uh, it also, you know, helps quite a bit with the proportion of the tower. Sometimes these like square towers, the proportion can, can feel a little boxy. Um, so this allowed these two slender um, tower elements to kind of highlight the verticality of the project uh, and the verticality of the units. Um, you know, I, I did at first have a lot of concern, or I guess it wasn't me, but a lot of people were worried about these kind of back units. And, you know, you're a little bit blocked on this side, a little bit blocked on this side, and you just have this alley view. But I think like some of the most interesting views actually are the ones that are framed. And I had some perspective um, with these kind of tucked back units. And you, you know, if you consider some of the most photographic moments in cities, you know, they're not the big panoramic view, it's the framed view, right? Mm -hmm. That crops in a view of the image of something beyond. 
And so these walls just become the background. And then what's left out is this cutout and, uh, and this moment uh, of what's happening. And, and sometimes those are actually, actually the better views. Here's another very famous one. So the drama of the bridge is, is highlighted because of the frame. Which is a scale too. Yeah. You can see the scale too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you can understand the scale and, and everything. So that was the, the idea of some of those back units. And I think they're, they're gonna be pretty effective with that. Mm -hmm. So circulation, um, I touched on it briefly, so I'll go through it. So this is your typical high rise hallway, right? Um, you get out of the elevator, you go through your hall, you find your unit somehow in this maze. And, uh, and that was something that, again, it's important for me in my projects that from the moment you walk into the building all the way through to when you're in bed or you're in your living room or anything, that it's a pleasant experience because you go through these spaces multiple times every day, right? It's something that's, that people just disregard most of the time, but I think the circulation are critical components uh, of any project because you're constantly moving through these spaces. And uh, you know, you, this is the last place you wanna sit and hang out with somebody and have a conversation. You just wanna get in and out of this space as fast as possible, basically. So, um, so we took the approach of completely opening up the circulation. I don't have renders of these, but this is the idea. This is obviously a fantasized version but this is a screenshot. This is a screenshot of my model of the circulation. So you come out of the elevator and you just have this extended balcony with this panoramic view uh, out towards the city and the mountains. And then just behind you here, um, you know, you have that little social place where you can hang out and talk to somebody uh, and kind of be out of the way. So as you're taking out your trash or leaving your unit to go do whatever, you you have this kind of moment, uh, again, this filter moment of going from your private space to your semi-private space down to the public space. So it's, it's a gradual break um, and, uh, and a pleasant experience, we hope. Uh, this is the other side. So again, that, you know, kind of some of the ideas that I had, I got this corridor got fairly blocked with the elevator that I had to put in and the elevator lobby, but we still have this filtered natural light that's going to be changing and moving throughout the day and it's going to allow fresh air to come in. Um, so these are kind of some of the ideas of, of the other circulation space that we have in the building. And then uh, biophilia, I, I touched on it before. It's obviously, um, I think it's more and more important uh, today, especially with some of the stresses in, of living in urban cities. Um, just being able to connect to nature is just, it, it's immediate, it causes basically an immediate release of tension. So I tried to integrate that biophilia as much as possible, especially in the community spaces, um, you know, giving some of that biophilia back to the city as well, which is critically important. Um, so, you know, this is a view up at the, the top of the tower, right? So even we're trying to integrate it on, on multiple levels of the building. So you can feel a connection to nature architecturally um, as well as when you're in the spaces. Uh, so you feel a little more grounded the building rather than just a, a floating shiny object in the sky. And then this is another render um, of, uh, of the entire building. So these little uh, boxes that you can see, these are actually um, double height uh, lofted spaces. So um, you can see the, the massing of the project was broken down um, by eliminating every other balcony. So this is actually like one of these squares is actually two units. So there's a unit here, and another unit on top. But you know, I, I broke down the scale of it so it feels like a 10 story building, even though it's a 20 story building. Um, and, uh, and then these, un these boxes are actually single individual units that span two levels. So they're spread out throughout the project and they have these extended planters that come off the end. 
uh, and they're kind of these, you know, a little bit more of a, a special treatment inside these units rather than what's happening. Uh, I also felt they broke up a little bit of the of the facade. I think Jorge and I talked about this before, and he, he had a, a different idea. But um, these, unfortunately, which you'll see later, uh, you know, we have to deal with the realities of construction and high-rise construction in the United States is very expensive. Um, so good or bad, I had to take these out, all these, all these planter boxes uh, that flow through here. And what we're doing instead is we're designing, um, we're designing planters that we will give to every tenant as they rent a unit and then they can, and with the plant, so they can come out and put their plant on their balcony and they'll have a choice of multiple different plants or planters and how they do it. So we're going to try to create that and actually let the tenants choose what they want. So each one will be slightly individualized and then we'll have you know, a series of plants and planters that we have designed that will hopefully start to activate that facade uh, in a similar way. The roof, you know, these these moments down here have all stayed the same. This kind of park above the street, the roof uh, gardens have stayed the same up here. This is a common roof deck uh, at the top of the building. And then these are some of the units. Um, so again, very simple spaces, just focusing on quality of space and light, uh, you know, trying to remove any excess. That's why we have shared laundry facilities. Um, you know, so people just have a, a, a very clean space. They don't have anything more than they need. Um, they, they have the structure of the building exposed. Uh, they have a very simple, you know, floor and just so they can focus on, on space and the views and you know, whatever else. 500 square foot to how much? How much? This is one of the top, this is one of the penthouse units. This unit is actually like 800 square feet. The, the, top, the largest one. Yeah, this one is, it's this unit up here. Mm -hmm. What you see. So you see like you're looking out of this window. Actually, this unit, it's this unit right here. Mm -hmm. So there you see it. So this has a this has a loft behind. This is a stair volume. It has a loft behind the stair volume. It has an 18 foot high ceiling. It has floor to ceiling glass. It has a big patio. I mean, this is one of the, the nicer units, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but but again, it was it was just about focusing on on space quality on, on most of these. This is another one of the, the two story units. This is actually this unit right here. So you can see, oops, oops, we just, I mean, typically this slab just connects here and it's two units, right? So we just cut the slab out. We had to put a beam from the column to another column and just drew the ceiling height, added clear story windows. And then, you know, in these ones, we had the, pa the patio extended out. Um, so, but again, just creating this big volume space, you can see like in the background, kind of the views of the bridge and the water there. Um, and, uh, and trying to, trying to just keep it clean and simple and honest, you know, I think that was one of the most important things is letting the architecture become the structure and letting the structure become the architecture and just letting that be as it is, instead of, instead of masking it. So we did deal, we are dealing with the realities of the budget right now. Um, this is, uh, I just wanted to bring that up because, you know, as architects, you always have to have some flexibility. Um, you have to be able to make hard decisions and you have to understand if you want things to be built, it's, you have to, you have to meet a budget. And we, we have the same restrictions on this project so we had to take out, you know, all the all the uh, extensions. Everything else stayed the same in the building. So, so again, getting back to the beginning of my talk, I think it's important whenever you do a building to have some key components that are critical to that project and stick with those throughout the whole process because you will have changes. You will have people telling you you can't do it, or it's you know I had so many people telling me I can't do a high rise like this. Um, even the architects we had hired to work with us telling us that it's not going to work. 
uh, we had to fire them and hire new architects. And um, so it was, uh, it, it's a challenge, um, but you know, it, it's also something we have to have something that we believe in as architects, something that we believe that can make life better for the people that are there. And, and there's key ingredients to that, that I think can't be taken away from the project. And for me, you know, it was these things that I had talked about. And, um, and even though I had to take some of the stuff out and I had to remove and simplify and, and make some changes, you know, never in my mind was it an option to, to lose those key original components that, that were part of the design. So again, that's kind of the, what I'm leaving you guys with at the end of this is stick to what you believe in. Don't let people tell you you can't do it because they will. And uh, the reality is most of the time you can do it. Uh, you just have to work a little bit harder to, to make it happen. So we're proceeding with this right now. We're submitting actually for a building permit uh, at the end of this month. Uh, we're on schedule to break ground in end of October. End of October. So how, how is it affecting the situation right now? You're on the on construction documents. You're working on, on, on all the MEPs, engineer structural and everything right now. Is it, is it, how is it being working uh, before, prior to, to the uh, COVID-19 situation and, and right now? I know you work from, from your home, yeah. so maybe for you it's not a, a difference, but how, 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 have you been, uh, how, how have you been affected with this? Or what do you think is something positive that it can affect maybe in cost? Uh, or I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I could definitely talk to that. I mean, so I don't have proof of this, but um, I believe that the way that the economy was going and the way that general contractors were working, you know, they were so busy. Everyone was so busy um, and there was so much work. And, you know, a lot of the challenges with this project are budget driven. And these general contractors, I think after going through all this are, are one of the biggest problems of the housing crisis because you know they, they're too busy to deal with you. So they just give you very high prices uh, that are unrealistic um, and they don't care because they have so many other projects going on that you just get these crazy numbers that you know, take you, make the, you know, I'm developing this project, so I have to make sure it works for my partners and it, it's financially viable and it makes sense. Um, so when you start to get these numbers, I'm also a builder, so I build, so I understand construction costs. But when you're working with these general contractors, I mean, just their, just their general conditions to manage the construction, they had 15 people staffed to it and a $3 million, that doesn't even include their fee. That's just their overhead, $3 million. And, uh, and then on top of that, the subcontractors are, you know, it's just, uh, it's crazy. You know, a, a, a sliding glass door is, is $15,000 for like a simple, you know, it's just, you feel like they're just giving you a number so they can just, you know, buy their jet ski at the end of the year type of thing. So anyway, that's enough about that. Um, but what, what, what I'm thinking is going to happen, and I think that could be a silver lining into all this is a slowdown. And, you know, and I think not only in general contracting, but also in life. And it's giving us some moments to pause and reflect and understand what's important, what isn't important. Um, and, um, like, uh, you know, some of the sustainability components, you know, I think that are integrated in this project um, are a little bit advanced. We're doing like a shared car program uh, that has all electric vehicles. So I think, you know, a lot of the stuff that's happening here and, you know, the, the workspaces and the building and all of that, I think all of that is, is going to be more and more part of our daily life. And I think we're going to, um, you know, maybe slow down the pace of everything, which I don't think is a bad thing. Um, 
And, and we're hoping to, you know, capitalize on some of that and get a little bit better pricing when a lot of these, you know, projects that are, are, are going up right now, what I'm thinking is a lot of projects are going to get put on hold. Um, and, and then at that point, the general contractors and the subcontractors are going to need a, more work. Uh, I think they're going to get a little more reasonable on their pricing and, you know, and then what that will allow us to do is build better quality buildings. Uh, it'll allow us to build, you know, include more sustainable, uh, program elements, um, to the buildings. It'll give us a little bit more freedom to do better architecture and, uh, um, rather than you know, uh, a, su a guy who's super busy, who sees something different that he's never done before, it just gives you a, a high price because he doesn't want to deal with the headache of how to do it. Um, so I'm hoping that maybe some of that laziness uh, that I see, you know, goes away and people spend a little more time on doing things that are actually meaningful, things that are good, things that are going to be lasting. And, and things that are important to humans rather than just their their money or their bottom line, you know? And I think there's a, a human aspect that's gonna come out of all this where we'll have a little more value on our lives, uh, on the spaces we live in, now that we're all stuck inside of them all the time. And uh, I think we're going to get a greater sensitivity to, to our spaces and, you know, to to how we see our living environments and, and our cities and everything else. Yeah. Uh, so I'm hoping, hoping this project uh, can be reflective of that. I have an, another question. Like when you presented the, the first uh, sketches of the, of the project and when you were designing it and how do, you, how do you went from doing projects of 18 units or, or smaller units a smaller, uh, the less densification. How, how did you came to, to just go to 20 stories? Uh, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't really me, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't have the idea to do this. Uh, it was my investor. So I had a conversation, we were having a conversation with our investor and this is actually, um, this gets into a whole kind of another topic, but there's a tax incentive uh, program in the United States and uh, it's called an opportunity zone. And opportunity zones are basically, um, so, to, so they're, they're kind of blighted areas in, in cities. Um, and you know that where, you know, the city wants developers to come help build new projects there and activate those components because they're either blighted or they're dead or there's no economic you know mm -hmm. uh, viability to them um so the basically the federal government created all these maps and they said hey developers if you build a project in these areas we're going to give you tax incentives uh so we're in one of those areas and um my investor was dealing with a lot of these taxes and when I pitched him the opportunity zone, he basically said, oh, this is great. I, I think we should do a high rise. Mm -hmm. okay. And I said, oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't even know like that. That was not what I was expecting, you know? Um, so mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm, I've never done a high rise before, um, but let's do it. I mean, why not? Let's try it. And so, it wasn't my it wasn't my idea to jump scale. Uh, I was I was looking at like a, a seven story or maybe an eight story project, mm -hmm. um, but just so happened he wanted to do this and uh, he. Had but to. I think I think you you're doing right because you you're offering uh, common spaces, or living spaces. I, I understand that is because the numbers needs to work, but you're pushing more to open spaces and, and to create a better community and then you created the four first stories to be public uh, which is nice and 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 also i'd like to ask you one question in regards i i the mail room that you talk about it, it's a, a programmatic uh, thing that normally we we put in buildings but in this case you decided to go further and because it's it's changing the way we live uh, if especially 
specifically in the U.S., uh, everybody orders everything through through Amazon. Yeah. Uh, or, or through internet in general. So, so the, all this uh, changing program, uh, it's it's affected because of the way we live. So it, I, here we go again with the situation that we're living on. Programmatically, what do you think it could change in the near future in buildings or in houses? Well, okay, so I've been thinking about this. Um, I think for one, the mail room is huge and the package room, like that is going to be one of the most complicated spaces in multifamily buildings. Um, especially now, everything is delivered, groceries are delivered. Uh, everything you buy online is delivered. Uh, you need complicated systems and not only for what's being delivered, but now what you're returning, right? So now you're, you're shopping and you, you know, you order four things and you return three. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that's good. I don't think it's good, but it's a reality that we're dealing with right now. Um, so that's one big thing. And then the car is the other huge thing. And um, I didn't really talk about it, um, but uh, on, this, on this project, we're not giving any private parking. We have, we have 25 parking spaces and uh, we are bringing in a fleet of electric vehicles that are, you can rent by the hour or by the minute or by the day or by the month. And, uh, and they're all shared among the building. So you, you basically have to drive an electric vehicle if you live here, or you have to park your car somewhere else. Um, and so, you know, we're taking that next step and I know it's going to be an inconvenience for people, but we believe that we have to get through that inconvenience to make a change. Um, you think that it's on the code right now or how, how did you approach that? So the code in San Diego doesn't allow, or they don't, in downtown, you're not required to park. You have you no parking requirement anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so you just put in whatever you want. And we're doing, um, we're doing the car stacker systems, you know, that rotate the cars around. Mm -hmm. So we're one story underground. Mm -hmm. This was also a budget constraint because it's so expensive to build underground. And, um, and that's why you see all these buildings with the hideous mm -hmm. three stories of parking right above the, mm -hmm. the sidewalk, you know? And, um, and so we were one story underground with, with, you know, several different car vending machine things and, uh, and all electric charged cars. Um, so, so that's one. And then the other thing that I, I've been interested in talking about this is you know, and talking about work, the work environment is, you know, I think actually it's pretty, people have discovered it's pretty easy to work from home. People have discovered it's pretty easy with, with, with Zoom conferencing like this and, you know, that you can, you can work from home and it's not that dramatic of a change. I mean, I've worked from home for a long time, but I have five or six Zoom conferences a day and we're still, everyone's still working. We're still fairly productive. People are transitioning to it. Mm -hmm. But I think what people are realizing is that they can do that. And more and more people are gonna want to do that rather than driving a car to work every day and deal with the traffic and you know all that other mess that comes with it. So I think that's going to eliminate some of the need for cars. And I think that's all gonna play into it. And by offering people those alternatives, they can stay here in this building and they can work from the building and they don't have, you know, they can have a, a conference room there or they can work in their room. The one thing that I think is interesting is all these people, you know, all these developers are doing these micro units right now, which is, is a whole nother topic that I think is interesting. But, um, you know, some of these units are 250 square feet. Um, and I mean, they're great when you don't have to be in your room that much, right? But when you have to be in your room like now all day, I mean, that I think that's very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where you walk in and, and I mean, for some people it's an affordability issue, right? And, and um, but I think developers are pushing, pushing the limits of that a little too hard. And, uh, and I, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how those are working and where you just walk in your unit and, and you know you have a bed and like no space to even like put a chair 
Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some of the ones that I've seen are that are transformable are, are work pretty good, but um, I just, I don't know, like, I don't know how, I mean, that was just one, one of the things I've been thinking about is I see more and more of these micro units going up, like how are those people handling these situations right now? Um, so, I mean, I think it's fine if you have a lot of alternatives in your building, because people need a space to have leisure activities you know people need a space to work people need a space to do exercise people need a space to do other stuff rather than just sleep um so i think um i think those spaces are going to be more and more important and especially the co-working spaces in buildings like this i think are going to be very important can you can you can you talk just a little bit about uh, the louisiana or the other projects you're working on uh, that you have developed and how how also it can be affected or how has it been affected or yeah so i own louisiana and like um if any of you are on my instagram you'll see right now i have all my units for red um i can go to my website and just so you guys can take a look at it mm -hmm. um so we have rented this building to Sonder. Do you guys have Sonder in Mexico? No, I don't, I'm not sure, I'm not here. Today. You might not. <laughs> um, so this is Louisiana. So this is a building that was finished two and a half years ago that we own and operate. All of these units are um, Airbnb rentals. Mm -hmm. Uh, with except for two of the units that are affordable. And then um, on the ground floor is uh, a restaurant. And uh, down here, kind of, I, I lost my cursor somehow. Oh, here. <laughs> down here on the ground floor, we have a restaurant. Uh, you can see it. Well, you saw it. It was on like the, the cover of the title for this lecture. But um, so the restaurant is basically is only pickup service you know they they can't you can't go inside you can order on you can call and order order online and you have to pick up your food right so they're doing um 10 of the money that they were doing before this happened and then the airbnb units are doing less than that so you know travel is totally shut down you know these units are typically for people that are coming into san diego for a week or a weekend and they want to stay with their family and they get a full apartment with a kitchen and several bedrooms and, and they stay there um so now that business is gone and a lot of i mean all of the hospitality business is gone right now um and um and so it's interesting i mean luckily the company that rented from me is a very uh well-funded company so they're still paying 75% of their rent they're not paying full rent mm -hmm. um, but I don't know what's going to happen so I I had to nego I've been spending the last couple of weeks negotiating deals with them on how we're going to handle their rent because you know we still have to pay property taxes we still have to pay our mortgage we have to pay maintenance we have to pay everything still right so um So I currently have all of the units for lease um, and I have negotiated a deal with them. They're, they're really nice. They're fully furnished units with actually really nice furniture. Um, and um, let me see if I can show you actually. Something happened. If, if, so if, if anybody has some questions, uh, they can also do it in, in Spanish. And you can answer in English. I know you you understand pretty well. All right, I can I can answer in Spanish. So so it's open. For... De, de hecho, hay una función que para las preguntas eh, que se llama levantar mano, raise hand, hand. La encuentran donde dice manejar participantes. Si quieren eh, los que quieran hacer una pregunta pueden apretar ese botón y y con gusto les damos eh, la palabra para que puedan interactuar. Okay. Disculpa, no entiendo eso. ¿Qué? Okay. And my, my computer froze. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Hello. Can you hear me? I hear you, yes. yes. Okay. 
Uh, congratulations on your projects. I uh, really like the uh, this high rise. I, I was curious about how, how do you manage with the thermal? Is that more like a construction uh, question? How do you manage about thermal bridge having the structure inside uh, without any other materials? Mm -hmm. uh, we well, we do have. I mean, we do have a lot of exterior wall that is insulated. Um, so we have to have heavier insulation where we have those walls uh, in order to compensate for the thermal bridge of the concrete. Okay. Yeah. But do you have, I, I, but do you have the insulation inside the concrete or? No, the concrete is fully exposed, all of it. The insulation, so all the corridor walls, you know, that you saw, since the corridors are exterior, those are all like exterior walls. Okay. Uh, and then there's, uh, I, I could take you guys through this building, but my computer just literally froze. <laughs> um, I don't want to turn it all off because then I'll go away. But um, um, but there are quite a bit of exterior walls that are metal studs. And so we have to do, we're currently doing a two by eight wall with R31 insulation on those exterior walls. So we have a very heavy insulated uh, metal frame wall where there's where we can and that compensates um, that compensates for for the rest of it basically okay any other questions Otra pregunta. another question please raise hand <laughs> because your, your computer frozen no? <laughs> yeah. my computer is frozen I can still hear you guys, but I can't move anymore. Yeah, we can talk. <laughs> what? We can talk. That's fine. Yeah, sorry. I wish I could. I if I I'm worried that if I do something, I'd have to turn the computer off. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, at least we're listening to you. That's fine. Okay. So is there any other questions till now? See sí, Al Alvaro Al Obregón. Ok, vamos a, a darte la palabra, Álvaro. Gracias. Okay. Adelante, adelante, te escuchamos, Álvaro. Jeff, uh, congratulations on all your projects. I have a question. How did you move from a designing architect to a developer? Because I needed work. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I used to work with uh, Sebastian Mariscal, who also okay. already worked with and um, very, very talented architect. And um, when I went out on my own, I had no work. Um, I did a few competitions. Uh, I did a couple client projects. I've done quite a few client projects, actually. They just, none of them have been built, except for a restaurant. But um, I, through Sebastian, I learned development. Uh, I learned how to you know, do the pro formas and kind of operate the development. And I already learned through him how to run the construction and, you know, do all the drawings, obviously, for the architectural mm -hmm. component. So um, I had a studio. Uh, I wasn't making any money. I didn't have any projects. And uh, I started just looking for sites in San Diego. Um, I found a site in Little Italy. I put together a pro forma. Um, pitched it to an investor and the investor decided to back it. And uh, that's how it, kind of this whole thing started. And then from there, you know, we sold that building, uh, which was a successful project. And I was able to convert that into, you know, roll that into this project, Louisiana, and also build a house and studio. And, uh, and then I took one of my main investors here from Louisiana, and he's kind of the guy that's doing the high rise now. Um, so it just, it just, I mean, it originally happened because I was just trying to find work in any way I could. And then, uh, and then it just became a successful business and kind of went from there. Great. Yeah. Any other question, Enrique? Sí, tenemos otra pregunta de Eric eh, y Corito. A ver, Eric, eh, te escuchamos en este momento. Eric, ¿estás por ahí? Ok, 
Vamos, Eli. ¿Ya te, ya te podemos escuchar? No, no está por ahí. Ya le quité. No, no está, en, en, está sin... No, debemos estar escuchando en este momento. ¿Nos escuchas, Eric? O si no, alguien más, levante la mano. Para... Uh -huh. Hay problemas técnicos por ahí. ¿Alguien, eh, ¿alguien más? ¿Somebody else eh, wants to, to raise hand, please? Levanten la mano, por favor. Alguien que tenga un comentario, una pregunta, ¿se aceptan? Aquí está el, otra pregunta de ya, a ver. ¿Quién eh, está? The scale of the projects, Jeff. I, I know, I, I think I already asked this question, but looking at the, at the, at the Louisiana. Eh, The, the Louisiana, and then looking at the, the fellow project, the, 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 the 20 story building, which ones do you enjoy more doing? Like, you, I know it's the first one right now, the, the, it's, it's a, it must be like a challenge right now to, to go through this, 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 this tall. Uh, but looking at the image that it's on, right, on the screen right now, which one do you like better like, to, to, to work on? I mean, <laughs> You know, I, I, I think it's hard to say right now. I would like to have the opportunity uh, to do to to work on another high rise, knowing what I know now. You know, I've done. I, I know all the components and know very well the the design, like you know what works and what doesn't work in terms of these wood frame uh, kind of low rise buildings. The construct construction has a lot to do with it, right? but also the codes and everything else. But learning everything I've learned after getting through like all the challenges of the high rise, which was challenging for me at first, not only with the scale, but just all the program that has to go into it. Um, I think I, I would like to have an opportunity to do another one. But that being said, there's, there's definitely more, I'm doing two more projects in design right now that are more, Uh, on the scale of the Louisiana, a little bit larger. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more freedom, actually. Um, you know, when you're when you when you do a project like this, Louisiana, you can see like every single part of the building is different. You know, mm -hmm. and you have the capability to do that because you can make a little change here, and you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's all going to kind of stay within reason and within the same budget. As soon as you start doing something like that in a high rise, I mean, it's, it's that change multiplied by 20, you know? Yeah. So anytime you try to do something irregular, you pay a pretty heavy price for it. Yeah. Uh, so that's why so many high rises uh, kind of look the same and function the same. And I mean, there's very, there's very little, um, once you start getting into like digesting like high-rise architecture mm -hmm. there's a very very little change in the program of the high-rise i mean you need a core right and then you need columns and if you're dealing with concrete to support the slabs and to hold the whole thing together mm -hmm. uh and and then it you know it's a very fairly rigid structure and construction so You know, while there is a lot of different opportunities, there, there's not, I don't think there's the same amount of freedom of play as there's in these smaller projects. So I think those will always be a little more interesting and fun to play with. Mm -hmm. um, but the high rise is also, I mean, it's a whole different animal, you know, it's a whole different scale. And it's, you're working more with a, almost like an object rather than internalizing space as mm -hmm. much, you know? Yeah. It's a big challenge, I can imagine. Yeah. Do we have any other question, Enrique? Or? Sí, tenemos eh, una pregunta de Vladimir. Le vamos a dar la palabra en este momento a Vladimir. Eh, Vladimir, adelante, te escuchamos. Yeah, how are you? This is Vladimir. Congrats on your work, man. Really nice. So my question is that I noticed that uh, some of these projects that you're working on, is there a specific market that you're trying to get into in terms of uh, more of a high end, especially with this uh, type of economy going on right now and on, on, on situations similar to 
uh, do you see more of a positive going into a, a high-end residential multifamilies like you guys are doing or or what's your strategy um, uh, for the future? Um, I'm, I mean, I'm doing both. I, I mean, I don't see um, the, the fellow, you know, we're trying to not get into the luxury market. I, I think it's very uh, specifically not intended for that luxury market. There's a ton of that in East Village. I think we're more in a boutique market. I think we're going to be almost one of the only boutique, real boutique high rises in downtown. Um, so I see it and, and our units are, are affordable because, you know, we're, we don't have big two bedroom, you know, double master bathroom, huge walk-in closet that you see in a lot of these high rises that are just crazy expensive. Uh, our units are functional, but they're also simple and, um, they have good space and, you know, they don't. We, we didn't go into any excess in the design. There's, I don't think there's any ex anything excessive in that building. So we're able to keep our prices fairly low, which I want to keep it affordable. Most of our units here in the United States will rent for less than $2,000 a month, um, which if you know the downtown market is, is very reasonable. So, um, so on that component, I, on the fellow, I'm trying to keep it affordable. That being said, I'm doing a, a high-end project in La Jolla, in downtown La Jolla right now. Um, that will be a, a lot more expensive and a lot more high-end. And, and I'm doing the opposite of that in turn, I'm doing a, a very low-end co-living project in Barrio Logan. So I kind of am, am going to three different levels of that right now in three different projects, which I like. I don't, you know, I like being able to, to change um, change scale and change typology and change, you know, demographic as well. Okay. I think we can wrap it up. I don't know if, if, if there is other question already rising or if not, we can, yes, there is one. <laughs> it's going to be the last más, un momentito, nada más es que es un poquito. Eh, Max Yi, estás por ahí, te, te escuchamos, Max. Hey Jeff, uh, first of all, congratulations on, on all of your projects. I really admire, admire the design principles that, that you carry on. Um, I am wondering how you integrate or, or contemplate user appropriation of, of the space, um, especially looking at cities like LA, San Francisco, and, and New York, which we are growing to be like. Um, how do you contemplate that street art and, and for those uh, people that are living in the space to, to take that uh, control, you know, to make it their own and, and to add more culture or, or value or what's your take on that if you think they should have that flexibility or not. Are you saying to to like design their space or to like own? To, actually to, own to, to take ownership over this, not literal ownership, I mean like the cultural ownership over a space like we're looking at the Louisiana right now and, and I really love the, the facade, the all black and, and how it works, but I'm wondering if you are designing thinking that someday that uh, black uh, vertical wall that's facing uh, one of the streets will turn into a perfect space for some wheat pasting posters from a street artist or, or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I totally, uh, I totally, in uh, want that and I'm trying to work on that in my projects. Actually, I started a sister company called Void that does specifically that, that just works on collaborations um, with artists and, you know, that, that integrates with or complements the developments that we're working on. And it's also a, a way to give back to the communities that we're developing. In. So actually, can you guys still see my cursor? Not anymore. Are they? Well, on, on this middle image of Louisiana, you see the car on the left with two guys standing out there on the street. Mm -hmm. Yes. On the opposite side of that is a huge 500 foot long blank CMU block wall. Um, so we've commissioned a local artist and we are fundraising and uh, paying for a giant art installation with lights and, and 
uh, acrylic panels that's going to go along that wall and just be kind of this really cool moment uh, of this corner for the city. Um, so, you know, I, I do recognize the need for that. Uh, I don't think I would ever come in and paste all over the black walls just because, you know, I think the architecture um, it's, it's isn't, meant, isn't meant for that. It's already um, but there are moments where it, it is meant for that. And I think mm -hmm. it's, it's being sensitive to those moments like mm -hmm. on the big blank wall across the street and actually capturing the space of the entire street instead of just, you know, a, a poster on a wall, but making it into a space that's for the community. Go, cool, thank you. Okay, well, I think we, got, we have to wrap it up. Uh, normally our, our talks are gonna be one hour plus 15 minutes of Q and A's. So uh, thank you very much, Jeff, for your time. Uh, too bad that, it, that your computer freeze at the end. <laughs> you wanted to see the walkthrough. But, maybe uh, Jorge, what? maybe if Jeff uh, stop sharing uh, the, the the screen and maybe can fix. Can can we try? Stop sharing the screen. Stop sharing the screen. I mean, I no, think the computer is free. I need it. It's a computer. Yeah, he needs <laughs> the to... program. Does anyone know how to force quit? No, that's that's fine, Jeff. Don't worry. <laughs> I don't know how to. Don't worry. I will have to turn it off and on. No, if you, if you turn it off, then you're you're out. Yeah. <laughs> well, well in, from all our school, we, we want to thank you. Thank you very much for your time. I know you're very busy and, and, and we would like to just uh, congratulate you for your work. It is, it is very uh, efficient for us and very important to see an architect that works as an architectural designer, a real estate developer and, and construction manager to tell us how 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 he's doing his his work uh, as you said at the beginning architecture is first uh, i know you we you, you put that very important message on it which it is uh, we like to always think about our, our architecture as the main component the the, po the poetry of our architecture on it uh, instead of the numbers so that was one of the reasons why I, I was asking you about the the, 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 the tower versus the, the more uh, human scale uh, projects. So, but, it's, but that's the challenge that we have to live in as architects. And we have to be realistic on when we're where we're living and how to make our, our built, built environment better. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I don't know if you have any, any last thing to say. No, thank you guys so much. Um, yeah, I, I wish I could have shown you the, the tower in 3D and all that, but that's okay. Thank you guys for coming um, and uh, appreciate your questions and everything else. And thank you, Jorge, for inviting me. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for, for, for being here, for taking your time in, on this week of vacations. And thank you, Jeff. Okay. Yes. Have a great day. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm.